सब्सक्राइब नाउ एंड प्रेस द बेल आइकन नेवर मिस एन अपडेट हेलो एंड वेलकम टू हेल्थ लाइव एट सीनियर्स टुडे वी आर डिलाइटेड टू हैव हियर विद अस डॉक्टर आशीष कॉन्ट्रैक्टर डॉक्टर कॉन्ट्रैक्टर इज डायरेक्टर ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ रीहैब मेडिसिन एंड स्पोर्ट्स मेडिसिन एट द सर एच एन रिलायंस फाउंडेशन हॉस्पिटल इन मुंबई he has been with the hospital since inception which is 2014 and uh, set up the department he completed his medical education from the tn medical college which is tnmc at the nayar hospital in mumbai and his post graduate training at the university of virginia in the united states he has worked in the and trained in the us for several years he set up the department of preventive cardiology and rehabilitation at the asian heart institute in mumbai and was with the institute since its inception in 2002 till 2014 uh he was part of the asian heart team of doctors involved in the redo bypass surgery of former prime minister dr manmohan singh in in jan 29 to in in jan sorry 2009 and was in charge of the pm pm's rehabilitation team as well uh dr contractor has been the medical director of the sanjay chatter mumbai marathon since its inception in 2004 till 2014 he is a vice president of the iccpr which is the international council of cardiovascular prevention and rehabilitation and governing council member of the national society for prevention of heart disease and rehabilitation dr contractor is a visiting lecturer at the university of chester in the united kingdom he serves as the certification director of the american college of sports medicine in india since in since 2003 and is the only authorized uh, doctor in the country for the same in fact um, in addition he is faculty and member of board of studies of the svt college of home sciences smit university he has received several academic and social records the most recent being an award for excellence by his alma mater the campion school in mumbai in 2009 and the outstanding zoroastrian in medicine award by the zoroastrian trust funds in india in 2016 welcome to health live at senior today dr contractor Thank you, thank you so much for having me, Ochita. Thank you for the introduction. How have you been? And uh, uh, you know, as we ask uh, all the doctors here, given the fact that we started out uh, around the time of COVID, uh, what's the situation now? Uh, clearly, the the numbers have gone down, but uh, we also have cases of H one N one and uh, dengue and, uh, and and the like. So. you know i think handling this today is almost i i, I want to say it's almost as philosophical as it is physical right in the one sense we are living a new normal for lack of a better word and the sooner we accept it it's the better it is infections as we've clearly seen now in our two year track record sort of rise and fall in waves now if you're in the middle of one of those waves of infection and especially if you're a senior citizen i would say we certainly need to up the precaution which means definitely if a wave is going on of infection avoid crowded areas and and take extra precaution once we're out of those waves you know continue leading your normal life if you're in a crowded indoor area have your mask on if you're outdoors you can have your mask available and you don't necessarily need to put it on all the time and and i think the micro environment in these infections is more important what i mean by micro environment is if i'm sitting in my room and there's someone sitting right across me and i'm going to spend 30 minutes in a closed environment then it's better to have a mask but if i'm with that same person outdoors taking a walk i may not necessarily need to have a mask so i think we need to just be a little bit practical i've seen people swing from one way to the other where initially they were completely scared did not do anything did not step out of a month and then suddenly as if the flood gates broke and then then their behavior was completely on the other end of the scale so i think i think a rational in between is what we're looking for and you certainly need to live your life you need to get out there because i feel that this especially in senior citizens i think there's been a huge drop in 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 their cognitive ability in their physical ability because of being cooped up for so long and the first few months till the time you know everybody was not vaccinated i i understood the reason for that now that hopefully everybody on this call is vaccinated and boosted at least once i think i think it's time to start start living your life well you know doctor before uh, we get on to your presentation the, one of the worries is that 
And I know people who have, uh, who have contracted the virus without really any interaction with, without really going out in the crowds, without uh, you know, having uh, interaction with strangers, save the domestic health, et cetera. So how does one get it? How, you know, as in, how, how does one protect oneself? Because you can't be wearing a mask all the time. No, so I'll, I'll tell you, here's the thing. Everybody, and I've observed is human nature, okay? And I've seen it with my family, my you know, friends, everyone. We have this inherent belief that somebody near and dear to us or somebody we know will not give us the infection while some random stranger will. So I've seen it time and time again where people have been extra careful, but the moment they start meeting family, and these were in the early days when people were living sort of apart, you know, they would let the mask down and the guard down. You're very likely to get it from a loved one. And that loved one is likely to get it, you know, going out in the real world. So if you've got senior citizens who just don't step out of their house, but they meet their son, daughter, grandchild who is out there, they interact in our Indian households. One interacts with somebody at the door at a minimum five times a day. Newspaper wala, bread wala, mill, vegetable. And it's, it's human nature that every single time you don't have your mask on. And that's a fact. So every time somebody's told me, oh, they've not stepped out of the house, you sit and you analyze with them for 10 minutes and you realize they are having unmasked interaction. So, you know, it doesn't come by magic. It does come with unmasked interaction with somebody. Sometimes, yes, you may be unlucky and maybe a very short interaction and you may still get it. And then at other times, um, you don't get it. So it, it doesn't just come. When you analyze it, there's always been some. Absolutely. Change. I agree with you. I, I think uh, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that we are not unmasked all the time. Uh, great, doctor. Uh, so over to you for uh, your, your presentation. Those of you who have questions for Dr. Ashish Contractor, please put them in the Q&A tab. As always, uh, uh, put your age and your gender so that Dr. Contractor could give you a considered reply. But before you put in your questions, please do look at the presentation. Please do look at uh, what he has to say, and then you can uh, put ahead. But Dr. First of all, I want to ask you this, and I'm, and I'm sure your presentation has, has it. This is the first time we've had somebody on rehabilitation medicine. So please do tell us what rehabilitation medicine is first, and then uh, go ahead. So in a sense, what we do encompasses a very wide range. And, and for senior citizens, it really, it, in, in simple words, we are helping people live better lives. You know, almost everybody has some, if I might say so, ailment which reduces their physical or sometimes mental ability, whether it's a neurological ailment, cardiac ailment, uh, pulmonary ailment, all of those, right? And our center works to get them better. I have a simple one-line motto, which I've used all my life in my, my clinical practice, is I want to get you better than before. So if you come to me with a problem, I don't want to get you back to where you were just, just before you had the problem. I want to get you better than what you were even before the problem. Because most people do not live very, if I might say so, conscious and healthy lives. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes a problem like a heart attack to make the person wake up and then start leading the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years of their life in a much, in a much better manner. So in rehab, we look at all the body systems, and I'm going to cover some of them in this presentation and help people become better than before. And if you're one of those few and unlucky people who have no ailment, then fantastic, continue doing what you're doing. Maybe we can give you some tips to be reach even a higher level. So I'm going to start my presentation. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen and I'll talk for approximately 20 odd minutes. Hopefully I'll cover cover some new ground, cover areas which you've not heard. I was, you know, Pradeeman was talking to me about this fantastic series that you all have been doing and it, and it looks like you've heard from, from lots and lots of doctors. So hopefully I'll be covering some new ground and I'll get started. Pradeeman, I assume you can see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Thank you. Over to you. So today I'm going to talk about this sort of question of, you know, who is old, what is old, what are some of the common disorders that, that one might face? What is a basic exercise prescription you can do to, to keep yourself healthy and talk a little bit about balance and fall prevention because this is a very 
prevalent problem in seniors and we'll end with some conclusions. So, you know, I've often found people, you know, two extremes. I, I, you sometimes find people who are 55 and 60 years old and they, they, they consider themselves old. And then you've got people who are 80, 85 and you know, sprightly and full of good health. So what are some of the definitions? Yeah, you know, the geriatric society said today within the old, so you're 60 to 69 or some people define it as 65 to 75 is your young old. Okay, so you're still young within the old category. Once you're crossing 70 to 79 or 875 to 85 is your middle old. And more than 80 or more than 85 is when you're old, old, or the oldest old, as they say. So all of you who are on this call and who are you know, below 70, you're still young, okay? So just do not think of yourself as old. Um, what's life expectancy in our country? This is data I accessed from the WHO website today itself, and the last time they updated it, they said it was December 2020. Japan has the highest life expectancy for both sexes, and the average is 84 years. U.S., which surprisingly is, is not even in the top 30 in the world, is, is 78.5 years. And India, which falls somewhere between 130 and 140 in the world, is about 71 years. And that's the basic life expectancy, the average age of everybody who's born in the country. They have another interesting definition, which we call as health-adjusted life expectancy, okay? It's H-A-L-E is the acronym, which means how many years can one expect to live in a healthy, disease-free manner? And that number is about 75 in Japan, about 66 in the US, and 60 in India. So if you look at it in another way, an average of 10 years in the Indian context, people will live, but not in a very healthy fashion, right? Now, that's what we want to avoid. When I say we want to avoid, meaning we want to have good health right till the very end. And this is the typically what we call as the quality of life curve. Some people call it geriatric curve, okay? So as you can see on your y-axis, we've got functional capacity. Functional capacity simply is the ability to do your activities of daily living. And on your x-axis is age as you age, okay? As you go rightward, you're getting older. And the blue line is the graph. And this is typically the graph for most people. Over time, their capacity goes down and, and they gradually go into decline till, till one day they, you know, till one day they die, frankly. And people with a high risk lifestyle, those who are inactive, smoking, poor diet, the three most important components of lifestyle. Okay. Um, this is how a graph looks like. So this last bit. The red bit out here, we call it deficient survival, which means that the person is living, of course, but they're not living a very productive or a very healthy life. The quality of life is poor. And this is what everybody would ideally like it to be, right? That you maintain a high quality of life, you're able to do everything that you enjoy doing, literally right till the very end, and one fine day you peacefully pass away in your bed. I mean, this doesn't usually happen, but this is what would be ideal. And a person who leads a low-risk lifestyle, an active person, a non-smoker, someone who eats healthy, there's more chance of this happening. So as Aldous Huxley famously said a while, you know, several years ago, the goal is to die young, but as late as possible, right? In other words, to be healthy up to the very end. There's a nice National Geographic issue a while ago, it's 2005, where they studied different regions of the world where people lived the longest. Okay, where people, the regions where they commonly had people crossing 100 years of age. And they said, what are some of the common uh, factors of these groups of people? And let's look at what they found. Okay, so they looked at three regions of the world where people lived the longest. One was in a Sardinia region of Italy. And what they found in this group is that they drank red wine in moderation. They shared the work burden with the spouse, so nice good communication in the family and they ate a certain type of cheese called pecorino cheese which was high in omega-3 that's what they found in this region now that does not mean i'm asking all of you to suddenly start drinking red wine please don't get that message one region in california in the loma linda region of california they found that they ate a lot of nuts and beans this was the adventist community so they observed a sabbath a day of rest what they call it and they had a lot of faith they were very religious 
And the third, which is the most famous, are the region of Okinawa in Japan, where they found that they kept lifelong friends, great social networks, which we see commonly in our country as well. They ate food in small portions. They have a saying out there in Japanese, which I can't, I can't, I don't know the Japanese words, but it roughly translates into eat until you're 80% full and then get up off the table. Okay. And the last is what they call the Japanese ikigai, finding a purpose in life. All your life must have some meaning. And then they found something common for all three regions. They were not smoking or very, very less uh, cigarette smoking. They had great family lives. They were active every day. They did something or the other every day. They were socially engaged and they ate a lot of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Their diet was full of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Now, please remember, a very large portion of our Indian population is vegetarian. But that does not mean they have too much of vegetables in the diet, right? A lot of the diet tends to be rice, dal, chapati. So fresh vegetables, fresh fruits are actually lacking in the average Indian diet. So this was what they found in people who lived the longest. This was another interesting study which looked at the probability of an additional 20-year survival to age 90 for somebody who's 70. And what they found, I'm just going to read this one last line, the probability of living to age 90 is 54% in people who don't smoke, don't have diabetes, are not obese, don't have high blood pressure, and don't have a sedentary lifestyle. Versus 4% in people who had these factors. Of course, genetics also plays a role, but apart from genetics, smoking, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and sedentary lifestyle were most important. And the causes of premature mortality, the most important cause is behavior, our lifestyle. It's in our hands, our control. Okay. And in this obesity, lack of exercise and smoking were the most important. So around aging, the factors that are most important, one is heredity. Now that's the one thing which we cannot change. So there's no point in talking about it. Then is the lifestyle that we have, which consists of our nutrition, our diet physical activity, our environment, our coping abilities, our social support system, our social networks, all of these are extremely important for healthy aging. In terms of the disorders of the elderly, specifically in India, 29% found they had arthritis, 21% high blood pressure, 13% cataract, 10% had diabetes. These were some of the uh, common ones, okay? And they found that 8% of the elderly have at least one functional disability and about 73% have some physical disability, okay? The elderly who have at least one chronic disease are most likely to report functional and physical disability as compared with those without disease. So what are some of the physical disabilities related to vision, hearing, um, walking with the teeth, difficulty in chewing, speaking, memory, Functional disability, they require help for activities of daily living, such as bathing, dressing, um, going to the toilet, being mobile, uh, continence, and feeding. I'm going to skip some of these are more technical. So let's, let's come now to the part about what we can do about it. We've, I've given you a setting as to what is our average lifespan, what are we hoping to achieve, how do we change the curve? What are the main factors that are going into leading a healthy lifespan? Let's talk a little bit about the benefits of exercise on health. Okay. So honestly, and I, I say this in many of my presentations, if all the benefits of exercise could be put into one pill, okay, one pill which we could just pop, that would probably be the best selling and the most popular pill available in the world. Okay. Because Exercise improves your heart function, helps with your weight, helps with diabetes, helps reduce your risk of a fall, and we'll talk about that. Improves osteoporosis, makes your bones stronger, improves memory, and reduces your chance of mental health issues such as depression. So all of these positive effects on health are there because of exercise. Okay, And these are all proven research-based studies. It's not something that I'm just sort of making up and telling you. What about the exercise or effect of exercise on the brain? So several years ago, 
we had the belief that the number of brain cells that you had were fixed once you achieved sort of early adulthood. And then as the years went by, they slowly, slowly just went down and there was nothing you could do about it. That's what we believe, that your mental decline was inevitable. There was nothing you could do about it. Today, we have found that that's not true. There was a lovely article and there are several more like this, which says when neurogenesis encounters aging and disease. What does neurogenesis mean? Neurogenesis means growing of new brain cells, which at one time we thought was impossible. Now we know that it can happen. And thanks to better neuroimaging, we can see this in action. And okay, this is a technical medical slide, but it's easy to understand. Look at the top two pictures. Okay, you will see the all these green little dots put together or this tree-like green structures are your brain cells. And you can see very easily that in the bottom section, the number of green cells or brain cells are more. These brain cells were those who did not exercise and these were in people exercising. So very clearly it shows that a person exercising regularly has, in simple language, better brain function. And they showed that three things help in better brain function as one ages. Regular exercise, a healthy diet and constantly learning in life. It doesn't matter if you're 70, 75, 80, 85, keeping mentally engaged. And I'm sure many speakers have told you the same thing earlier. Simple things, doing a crossword puzzle, doing a Sudoku puzzle, um, memorizing a poetry which you like, uh, prayers, learning some new prayers, anything which keeps your mind active and occupied is very good for it. What about endurance or aerobic exercise? Walking, an elliptical trainer. Everybody in this picture is over 70, 75 years old and they're all exercising, okay? Um, brisk walking is the simplest exercise which most people can do. Cycling, swimming, all of these are different types of aerobic exercises, okay? Three to five days a week at a moderate intensity, which means not too fast, not too slow. Ideal is 30 to 60 minutes, but frankly, if you're just starting, start with five minutes, no problem. Start with five minutes and every week increase by a few minutes at a time till you achieve this 30, 35 minutes, okay? And if you've got health issues which do not allow you to go more than say 20 minutes, no problem. Maybe do 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening. You can split it up. Strength training. This is again very important and this is a neglected area. Everybody thinks that you'll be Umar, Uye, Buddha, Uye, how can you lift weights? No. In fact, I think for older people, strength training is as important, if not more important, than aerobic training. Because as you age, your muscle mass goes down. So you need to lift light weights to preserve muscle mass. Why do you need muscle mass? You don't need it to look like Salman Khan or to take out your t-shirt. You need it for activity of daily living. You go to the grocery shop to buy some groceries. Those groceries may be 5 kilos, 8 kilos, 10 kilos. You need it for that. When you come home, you want to lift up the groceries and put it up in your, in your kitchen cabinet. You need your strength to put it up in the kitchen cabinet. So you need this for your activities of daily living. Okay, That is very important. You're traveling somewhere. You have an 8 kilo, 10 kilo suitcase. And you have to put it up in the train compartment or the plane compartment. right? So you need strength to do all of it. So different, different types of strength exercises can be done. Now, those who are diabetic, exercise is fantastic. Exercise reduces sugar. But especially if you're taking insulin, check your sugar before and after exercise. Because exercise makes the blood sugar drop, you may need to reduce your dose of insulin, which ultimately is a good thing. But initially, you might feel a little hypoglycemia-like. Right? So you check the sugar. And if your sugar goes down, take a snack. Okay? Wear protective shoes, wear good shoes because diabetics often have small, small injuries which they don't feel because they have neuropathy. And when they have neuropathy, they don't feel small injuries and sometimes those small injuries can become bigger. Okay? Um, for respiratory issues, breathing exercises, yoga exercises, all of them are very beneficial. Um, we do pulmonary rehab. People with lung issues, we get them in and we attach oxygen and we help them to exercise. One last area I want to touch upon is falls. In India, the prevalence of falls in people who are crossing 60 can be as high as up to 50%. And if you fall, 
And if your bones are weak, as which happens with age, and you bite, chance have a hip fracture. This can be very, very catastrophic. It can dramatically reduce your quality of life. Okay. So balance problem are the greatest cause of fall. And balance problems are because sometimes you may trip over something. Your eyesight may be weak. Sometimes you take so many medications, and those medications sometimes cause your blood pressure to drop. Especially when you get up from a sitting position, suddenly your pressure drops. Often you see people at night they get up to go to the toilet, and and at that time they have a fall because the pressure has suddenly dropped when they stand up. Okay, this is the pressure dropping. So in our department, we test people for balance. We do a clinical test where we stand, make them stand on different surfaces, close their eyes, put the hand forward, things like that. And we can also test them in a computerized manner, so we get a proper accurate number. And then to help with balance, we have things like a balance class where people take part in a group class. Um, we help you with home modifications to prevent falls. You know, keep keep grips next to your commode, next to your shower area, so you can get up in a easy manner. We deal with stroke patients. We have a stroke support group. We have a pulmonary support group. Speech and swallowing is also very important. Often people, especially if they've had neurological issues, they have difficulty in talking or they have difficulty in swallowing. And those who have difficulty in swallowing, sometimes the food or the liquid goes down the wrong way and that can cause a lot of problems. Okay, so that is very important to take care of speech and swallowing. We have a memory clinic, a memory school, if people find that they're losing their memory. And again, to forget small things like where you left your keys a few hours ago, or the name of somebody you met you know, yesterday, that's okay. But if you start forgetting things like where you live or your close relatives' names, then that's a problem, right? And you need to be evaluated. We also have yoga, which is a very important component of healthy living. And we conduct classes regularly. Just want to say that age is not a bar to, to live healthy. Okay, There are several examples. This lady at 92 ran a full marathon and she started running only at 86. George Bush, the American president, um, was, you know, celebrated his 75th and 80th, 85th and 90th birthday with skydiving. So all of it is possible. This is closer home, there's a lady, Man Kaur, who at 103 was throwing the javelin. Vasanta Samuel at age 80, she won championships in, in senior citizen. Okay. As this is a picture of a 75-year-old lady doing exercises which are very difficult on two unstable surfaces and lifting weights. And I'll tell you a little secret. This lady in the picture is my mother. So there is no reason why at any age you can't be, you can't be physically active. This is a picture of some of our patients with heart disease running, you know, taking part on the World Heart Day run. This is a picture of Forja Singh at 100. At age of 100, he ran the full marathon. And I, I had the pleasure of meeting him when he visited Mumbai as a brand ambassador of the marathon about I think, six to seven years ago. So bottom line is that we are here, our team is here, and, and all of you can live healthy. Um, you need to have a team of people working with you, a physical therapist, speech therapist, nutrition is very important, yoga, your doctor, and, and at the center of it all is, of course, you, the patient, and the family member. So the message, the take-home message is, is very simple. Everyone can lead a healthy life. Everyone can improve their quality of life. It's not very difficult. Uh, you can achieve it. And even if you have obstacles, if you have medical issues, that's okay. Most of them can be overcome. And even within those issues, you can lead the healthiest life possible. Okay. So that was my message to you. And I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Contractor. I think a very good and uh, detailed presentation that you had. Uh, those of you who now have questions after uh, the presentation, if at all you have, please do put them uh, in the Q&A tab, as always, and uh, uh, I will have them addressed to uh, Dr. Contractor. But I've got three questions uh, for you, Doctor. Sure. One is, uh, uh, Doctor, I'm not, I'm not living in Mumbai, so I do not have the... Uh, benefit of uh, your hospital, uh, but do hospitals in, across the country have uh, a rehabilitation center or is it only in large hospitals like yours? Yeah. 
So to be honest, unfortunately, um, this is an area which is not given that much importance, um, especially in hospitals. And for one very simple reason, that space is always a crunch, especially in our, our metro cities, and, and they find it easier to set up something else instead of a rehab center. But if you have, sometimes you may not have the space, but if you have a right team who has the right training and the right mindset to work with the patient and give them good advice, there's no reason why you can't do all of these things at your own home. But you need a motivating and a nurturing set of clinicians who will hold your hand and guide you as to what's the what's the right thing to do what's the optimal thing to do right i mean it's all very easy we all know we must exercise we must take care of weight we must not smoke we must eat better we all know that there is nobody on this call today who doesn't know that but how to actually do it is when you need a team to kind of give you the right and motivating advice for it Doctor, we have one more question. What is the difference between rehabilitation and physiotherapy? Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, rehabilitation is looking at the person in a very holistic manner and looking at every aspect of their physical and mental well-being to get them better, right? Physiotherapy is one component. So as part of our rehab team, the physiotherapist is a very, very important person, but it's not the only person. So for example, if you had a stroke, a physiotherapist is very important to get you back, you know, your physical aspects. But you'll also need a nutritionist to help with the diet. You'll also need a speech therapist to help you get your, your speech proper if that's been affected. Um, you will need what's ideally what's called a clinical psychologist, or sorry, rather a neuropsychologist who will assess you from a neurological um, angle and cognition. So all of them form part of the team and the physiotherapist is a very important person as part of the team. So typically, what is the kind of uh, qualification that one must look for, especially in smaller cities, uh, you know, where one can be sure that uh, the person in question is, uh, is qualified? Because a lot of physiotherapists also are not medically qualified doctors, so to say, right? Correct. No. So I think like in, like frankly, in every walk of life, it's not just for medicine, right? It's important what the person has been trained for and what they claim. Now, that even applies to a doctor. So if you've got somebody who's a gastroenterologist, he may be the world's best gastroenterologist. But if he says, I can do brain surgery, that's just wrong. <laughs> Correct? So a general physiotherapist has got basic training to deal with all body physical aspects. But if that same physiotherapist starts prescribing detailed medication for your stroke and all that may not be correct. So everybody needs to um, needs to respect the boundaries of their knowledge and deal within it. Then this comes experience. Now somebody may have done, so for example, a, a general physician, but he spent 20 years of his career working in a neurological specialty hospital. Though me and he may have qualified to be a general physician. Yes, he would have experience in dealing with neurological patients. So the experience of the person counts as much as just what their basic qualification is. Right. Uh, doctor, there's a question which has come in from someone who says, I do not have, uh, I have just checked, I do not have a rehab uh, 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 center in my city, which is Coimbatore. Uh, is it possible to take a, a teleconsult uh, advice from uh, from somebody like yourself? Yeah, yeah, sure. Today, I mean, there was no reason he couldn't do it earlier, but COVID, frankly, accelerated, right? I mean, there was no reason we could not have this meeting pre-COVID. It's not that COVID invented video conferencing, but thanks to COVID, this has become commonplace. Before COVID, we would never really be doing this, but now thanks to COVID, we're doing this every week, right? So absolutely, we can do 90 per not. 90, but maybe 70% of the things we do physically out here, we can even do it, you know, by video conferencing, except for certain specific, like if somebody's got a bad stroke and we need to give them physical help to make them do things, we may not be able to. But we also work with local people. So there are so many examples, stroke patients we work with across the country, where in their smaller town, they have their local therapist who's there, but on video is one of our people and they're constantly talking to each other. and. 
and guiding them what to do. So a, a short answer to your question is yes, we certainly can help most people even via video consult, giving them advice, which then do on their own. A lot of the times you're actually doing it live. So let me see if I can show you. We work with some patients where we've got instruments where, if I can show it to you right now, where we can monitor their ECG, even remotely. I've got this small instrument where they put it around their chest and we can monitor their ECG remotely. So I've got patients who had heart issues all across the country and we can live monitor their ECG and they can be exercising in their own home while we are looking to see if everything is okay and what's the next step we tell them to do. So absolutely, yes. Great, thank you. We have a few questions from uh, Mr. Sandeep Jain. His ah. first question, and which is interesting, is how does a veg vegetarian cope with deficiencies of minerals and vitamins? Do you suggest any specific supplement on a regular basis for bone and body strength? So in general, um, most people can get everything that they need for their bodies from nutritious food that they eat, including vegetarians. Okay. Now, if some people have very restricted diets, the one area where vegetarians sometimes struggle is protein. But especially in India, milk form and milk products form a very large part of our diet, which are great sources of protein. Um, but otherwise, minerals, vitamins, they could all be got through through regular um, regular diet. I don't think you have to supplement beyond a certain age. Some doctors may, may address you, and especially in ladies, um, at the time of menopause, they might give you a calcium supplement. But otherwise, on a routine basis, I don't, I don't recommend supplements across the board for everybody. If a particular person has a particular deficiency, I might supplement but not on a blanket basis. Right, thank you. We have uh, uh, Mr. Jain again, who says, any suggestions for knee pain that suddenly occurs on climbing stairs, but eases out as activity is complete? Uh, is this an issue? And he has another, another thing, which is not perhaps linked. So when I get up in the morning, just for three to four seconds, there's a crumpled feeling in the feet, which goes away when out of bed. Is this normal? So let's let's look at the first question first. Yeah. Any so suggestions for knee pain? So now knee pain, um, one of the commonest causes of knee pain, especially when one is aging, right? And and being a sort of a seniors today conference, I'm just taking for granted that most people are 55, 60 and above. Um, the commonest reason really is uh, osteoarthritis, okay, where the cushioning in the knee joint gets worn out. And it's a mechanical problem. There is not too much one can directly do about it. Um, so one is, you know, meet the doctor, get an x-ray. Let's look at how bad the problem is. But even in arthritis, it is shown that those who are more active have lesser chances of arthritis or lesser chance of it progressing. So, for example, if your knee hurts with walking 20 minutes, I tell people then walk for 10 minutes. But maybe walk 10 minutes two to three times a day rather than walking 20 or 30 minutes at a stretch. So you can split it up. So knee pain that happens on climbing stairs may likely be a sign of early osteoarthritis and, and you really need to get that checked out. It's not, it's not something which is worrisome, but it's good to be aware of. The next question about that crumpled feeling now, I'm not really sure what Mr. Jain is, is exactly referring to, but maybe sometimes people get a bit of a cramp. And maybe early on in the morning, it's sometimes colder in the morning, I guess, depending on what time you wake up. And in the cold, some people have a, have a little higher tendency of getting cramps. Cramps are a very poorly understood phenomenon. A lot of older people get cramps even in their car when they sleep at night. And honestly, there is, no, there is no obvious or easy answer. For some people, it's the cold. For some people, drinking a little bit more fluid helps. For some people, maybe the calcium is a little bit low in their blood. But those are all varied person to person. There is really no definitive um, answer to that. And, and, and maybe that's what he's getting. Uh, there's a question from Mr. Bharat Mehta, who's 66. Uh, is there any organization who has the, which has the facilities of health fitness center or health guidelines center for senior citizens? I mean, there are, there are several. So any, any, um, any good multi-specialty hospital will have people who will be able to 
help you out. Um, today, a lot of social organizations also do camps specifically for seniors. You have your rotaries and your lions and a lot of sort of even sunstars, religion-based organization, which run camps. I'm sure groups like yours also frequently run camps, but uh, uh, hospitals should have a good place for advice. There are some gyms, health centers, fitness centers, which are more scientific oriented, more medically oriented, and they also would be able to help them. There are some gyms which are more younger oriented and more just fitness and strength versus health oriented. So avoid those, but the more health oriented gyms will certainly be able to help you out. <clears throat> Doctor, we have two more questions. An interesting question for you uh, is, uh, Doctor, it was so nice to see your mother uh, uh, in the gym. Uh, just a question for you. Uh, at what age did she, she did she start exercising, and what is a what is a decent age to start exercising? Okay, so let's answer the second question first. What is a decent age to start exercising? Is the time you are born? Okay, so that's the age to start exercising. In fact, children are the most active. And I, I mean, I'm seeing it in a lighthearted manner, but I mean it. And I have, because I've got this interest, I've actually observed. And those of you, you know, if you're senior citizen, I assume your kids are beyond the age of five and 10, but you'll have grandkids who'll be in that area. Watch your grandchildren. If you've got especially two or three grandkids, watch the ones who are, say, four or five years old versus the ones who are, say, seven, eight years old versus, say, 10, 12 years old versus, say, 14, 15 years old. Okay. Like, sort of groups of two to three, three years, you will see that once they are five, six, and they are very independently moving around, they will almost all of them, they will run from room to room. They will rarely walk from one room to another. They'll be out in the plate and they'll be running even small distance. The doorbell will ring, they'll go running to the door. Um, you will come and visit them, they'll run to you. When they're seven or eight or nine, that running will reduce, but they'll still walk around the door. And when they're 14, 15, 16, they are like this all day long and they barely look up and they'll barely move where you are. Okay, So we were born to move. And somewhere along the way, life makes us, you know, highly, highly sedentary. Okay. So move more, avoid sitting. So all of you are on the call with your video off by listening to calls like this, right? Put on your volume a little bit louder, pace up and down. Now this call may be say one hour. I'm not saying walk for an entire hour, but Walk for five, six minutes during the call, then sit down for five minutes. Again, walk five, six minutes. Again, sit down. You'll have got so many activities. You know, I, I wear a, a, a step counter and and every time I teach a lecture in an outdoor, I mean, in a classroom setting, not on a Zoom setting, in a three-hour lecture, I'll have covered four and a half, five thousand steps. Half my day's steps are over just by pacing up and down five feet here and five feet there. Okay, and to answer your first question, my mother, I think, took up exercise in a fairly, if I may use the word, serious manner, apart from school days. And she's a, she's a practicing doctor. She started, I think, at the age of 30. She used to run on Marine Drive in the early 1980s, uh, five to eight kilometers, when it was completely bizarre or, or, or strange to see a woman run and that to run, not just take a walk. Okay, so that, that, that answers it. Yeah, I, I guess this question is basically, I, I think he was perhaps trying to ask as to how late can one start? Okay, I'll answer the opposite question. How late can you start? You can start at any age. There have been studies, and I'm not exaggerating, who studied individuals who started, and hear my words, who started exercise at the age of 90. And then they followed them for one or two years. And they found that even 90-year-olds got brilliant benefit. Right? For them, exercise could just mean that they sit in a chair and say they're lifting their hand 10 times or they're lifting their legs 10 times while sitting in a chair or doing things like this without any weight. Or they could take, say, a bottle of water and light bottle and do this and do that or do this. So there is no age which is too late to start exercise. None. And again, this is all being proven through research. It's not something that I'm just telling you. Uh, Doctor, one last question. I, I know it's a slightly unfair question to ask, but it's, it's, since it has been asked, uh, I may as well do that. How expensive is teleconsult for rehab as compared to a face-to-face -face consultation? So, so first point is whatever we do out here, and of course, we're not, not trying to um, at all promote what we do in any way, 
um, I, I must say that for a, if I may use the word, high tech, you know, fancy, lovely hospital, we're not expensive. Let me let me let me put that across. Our teleconsult charges are um, are similar, are about depending on what we do. So often we do one on one with say like a stroke patient or a cardiac patient for an entire hour. So those charges are the same as what we would do when a person comes in person. Sometimes we do group sessions. So we have three people or four people or five people. So some of those group session charges are typically 50, 60, 70% of the regular one-on-one -on -one charge. But overall, none of these charges, and again, I don't want to get into obviously a money conversation, are, are completely economical and, and reasonable. Let me guarantee you that. What we'll do, doctor, is when we, uh, so we typically, we not typically, we always carry uh, the edited uh, video of this session along with takeaways, which is, uh, uh, you know, just for your information, written by a, written by a qualified medical practitioner. Lovely. And these are put on, uh, on Monday uh, on, on the website. So we will put down, uh, uh, we, we will take the coordinates from your office and put it down in the, with the article. So those of you Super. who want to get in touch with Dr. Ashish Contractor or his team uh, uh, could do that. And just because this is question has again been asked, one last question, doctor. Would you suggest eating eggs daily for vegetarians as a measure of strength and body upkeep or it's just not needed? So let me, let me put it this way. If you are, if I may use the word culturally comfortable with eating egg and it's not, you know, you're not very uncomfortable. Um, egg is definitely, especially if you're vegetarian, I think it's a fantastic source of protein. So including egg in your, in your diet is definitely helpful. If, however, you are, are not keen or you are averse to eating it, that's also okay. There are other proteins which can supplement it. You know, one of the things about this non-vegetarian thing, and since you are also into sports medicine, is I remember reading about uh, uh, you know, people going into for tennis training to Hyderabad and the coach there insisting that you that some of his uh, you know uh, 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 later uh, you know award winning uh, students uh, you know switch to non vegetarian food so i guess that's perhaps one of the reasons but but it's it's good that you that you've said that vegetarians don't need to need to really worry about uh, uh, losing out on uh, on key you know constituents of a healthy diet thank you very much uh, dr ashish contractor for this session, it was excellent. I, I really wish we had done a session on rehabilitation medicine much earlier. We should have perhaps started out with a, with a session like that. But thank you very much. And uh, we would love to have you once again. And, Anytime. Uh, 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 you know, to, to your team at, uh, uh, which has facilitated this, a big thank you. And we will be back once again with Health Live at Seniors Today next Saturday at 5 p.m. Subscribe now and press the bell icon. Never miss an update.